Hello again, everyone. Finally, it is my pleasure to welcome our final speaker, uh, Bart. And Bart graduated from Oxford. He is currently a postdoc at the ORC, as many of us know, under Professor Burstimus. And his research focuses on the interplay between machine learning and operations research. OK. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Jessica. And thank you all for coming here, even though it's 4 p.m. in the afternoon after a long day of talks. And so today I'm going to talk about this work um, called The Voice of Optimization. And it's a joint work with my advisor, Dimitris Bertsimas. And after we put the schedule online of the talks, I got lots of questions about what does the voice mean? I got lots of people saying, ah, does this mean, is it some heuristic in OR? Is it your voice? Is it the voice of some book? Or is God? Is it Italian? Or, but I won't tell you now what it is. Otherwise, you won't follow me until the end of the talk. But the only thing I'll tell you is that this work approaches machine learning and optimization in an unconventional way, in the sense that usually we have been uh, working with optimization to solve machine learning problems. And there's been lots of work also from our group in the recent years to solve particular machine learning problems using optimization. But here, we will take the opposite approach. We will use machine learning and data and experience to solve and understand optimization problems. So let me start with a simple example that most of you may be already familiar with, which is an inventory management problem. So inventory management is the problem of deciding when to order certain quantities for an inventory in order to satisfy some demand and control the inventory level. So this problem is a simple, can be simplified in this way. There's lots of literature about it, but let's consider this simple case. So we have the inventory level that is XT, and it's the, we want to control it by ordering at each time a quantity UT, and we know in this case, in the simplified problem, the demand over a certain horizon between T0 and capital T minus one. So this is something we assume to know, so it's a deterministic problem. And the goal is to minimize the trade-off of the sum of two components of the cost. One is the cost that we have here on the left that tells us how much we pay by having a certain level of the inventory, and the second part of the cost is how much we pay to order a certain quantity ut at time t. So this is a very standard problem. And we have two parameters in the problem that are the initial value of the inventory and the demand that we have at each time t. So these are, these are parametric problem, and we want to solve it to decide when is the best time to order. And what we usually do in practice is that we, after formulating this and knowing the data, so the parameters, we just put it, feed it into an optimizer, and then the optimizer gives us an answer. And this is the answer in this, for this particular instance. So we have the trajectory of x, which is the inventory level. Then we have the, how much we order at each time, and the demand that in this case is concentrated around you. But what does this mean in terms of the parameters? I mean, we have the parameters, the initial value of the inventory and the demand at time t for each time in the horizon. So is anyone of you able to explain how do these parameters affect the optimal solution? Is there any takers? Anyone? So, okay, there's, you might guess, you might try to understand how they affect it by saying, okay, the initial value of the inventory is a certain level, then we, we know that it will be used to feed up the demand, and then we don't order at the beginning, and then we start ordering afterwards. But this is probably the only thing you might be able to grasp for, from this application, and this is a very simplified problem. But in general, it's very hard to understand how the parameters affect the optimal solution and how varying the parameters changes that. So 
In the rest of the talk, I will show you a nice interpretable way to understand how these parameters affect the solution and how this plays a big role in understanding the problem. So first of all, this is the first big claim of this talk is that optimization in real world is parametric. I mean, we never formulate a problem and solve it once. I mean, it almost never happens and probably only in the assignments of an operations research class. But apart from that, if you're in the real world, for example, in finance, you want to solve a portfolio management problem, we formulate it many, many times and we solve it multiple times a day with different data. And the data come from the previous solution that we had before and also from the stocks, how, they, how the returns behave in the market. And usually we use this data to feed some parameters into the optimization problem. And then we solve it over and over again. And this happens not only in finance, but also in robotics, transportation, and power distribution networks. So optimization is parametric. And in the real world, we are throwing out a huge amount of information that we accumulate by solving the problem many times. And what we do is, that, is just that we solve the problems again from scratch or without reusing this experience. So this is the typical approach that people have when they want to deal with the problem. So we start from data. Now, usually there's a practitioner who doesn't really know that much about optimization, who starts to think about how can I use data to solve my problem. Now, since the practitioner is not very expert about operations research, he tries, he's in Cambridge, he tries to find some OR experts, and luckily, Kendall Square, he finds some people that he starts to talk to, and they start a discussion about how to formulate the problem. So he says, okay, I want to minimize this, to minimize this cost, I'll describe it in this way, and then they start a discussion to define the cost, the constraints, and they come up with a model, which is a mathematical optimization problem that needs to be solved. Now, Luckily, this problem can be solved. And what happens in practice is that it's passed to an optimizer, which there's many commercial available ones and free ones. And what happens is that the optimizer then spits out a solution X star, which is a solution of the optimization problem. Now, the practitioner then gets the solution, which is a sequence of numbers, which can be somehow understood, but he doesn't really know how the data affect the solution. So if you, uh, how does the solution, how is the solution related to the data? Because this optimizer is something that, first of all, if you have commercial ones, we don't really know, even know what's going on inside. And even if we know that, it's a complicated algorithm that it's hard to interpret. So it's hard to understand from X star, how do we go to what matters for the practitioner? And this is the first problem. But the second one is also, what happens if you have new data? So if the data is slightly different, what usually what people do is that they start the process all over again, or maybe they skip to this part where they update the formulation, but there's no, they, people not, don't reuse the fact that we have solved exactly the same problem before, or a very similar problem before. So in this, to, I will tackle these two issues in the talk, and I will try to explain you what optimization, in my view, means, in the sense that optimization, from what I described, is something that takes data or the parameters and transforms it into a solution. And from what we've seen before, is something that can be understood relatively poorly, and it's most of the time it's a black box because we don't know very much how varying theta changes the solution. And in this talk, I would like to show you a way to open the box and interpret how this, what happens inside. And this is what we will call the voice in the sense that it will be, will express the meaning of what optimization does. And it will be something that we can understand and interpret. And Another benefit that, another thing that we would like to improve is that, of course, for many applications, optimization is too slow. We want to solve many of these problems very, very fast, 
and we don't have enough time between each solution to solve them. So many times we solve them only approximately, or we're not able to solve them. So by using what we learn from this approach, we will be able to solve these problems that normally takes few seconds or minutes in milliseconds. And this will be by just exploiting the experience and the data that we accumulated before. So inside this box, I will, inside optimization, I would like to decompose it in two parts, and this will be the two parts of my talk. So optimization will be composed by two components. The first one is a prediction that comes from the parameters and predicts a strategy. Now, a strategy is something that will, will become clearer later in the talk, but let's say it's something that encodes the solution. So from the strategy, we can get the solution very easily, and this is what we will call solution decoding. So I will first describe what the strategy means and how we can go from a strategy to the solution, and then I will explain you how we can use machine learning to predict what the strategy is. And this will be something by always keeping an eye on these two goals that we have in this work, to understand, so open the box, and make things go fast. Okay, let's talk about optimal strategies now. So the strategies, and I'll start with the strategies with a simple definition that is the complete information that we need to recover the optimal solution. So it's something that, if we know it, is like knowing the optimal solution, and we can extract it very, very fast. Now, it depends on the class of problems, and I'll start with a problem that most of you might be already familiar with, which is linear optimization. So we have a linear optimization problem that is parametric in theta, as we were talking about parametric problems. And if we fix theta, it looks like this. So we have a polyhedral set of constraints, the optimal solution is at the vertex, and this is the negative gradient of the cost. So the solution will end up there. And the optimal solution, now we're trying to characterize the optimal solution using this notion of strategy. And for this class of problems, we have parameters and variables, and we will play, now we will focus by fixing the parameters, how do the variables and the solutions change. And I will use I will introduce the notion of tight constraints. So when we have an optimal solution, tight constraints are the constraints that are satisfied as equalities at the optimal solution. So they're constraints for which Ax is equal to B. And in this case, you see that the solution here has these two red constraints that are active. Now, this concept is very closely related to the basic feasible solution, which is, um, which is exactly X star in this case. And in general, the tight constraints define the optimal solution with uh, the number of tight constraints is equal to the number of variables for non-degenerate problems. So it's equal to the dimension of the vector x. But if the problem is, non -de is degenerate, we will have many more tight constraints, but still a number of tight constraints which is way lower than the number of constraints of the problem. So knowing the tight constraints allows us to identify the optimal solution without having to deal with the whole full set of constraints. And so we know that if we know that, we know basically the solution. So we can identify a strategy, the number of tight constraints. So the indices of constraints that are active at the optimal solution, depending on theta. So if we vary theta, the constraints that are active will change. But if we know that, we know actually how to get to the optimal solution. And how do we know that? We know it because we can decode the solution. This is the second step of this box that I showed you before. And this is done by solving a linear optimization problem where we just care about the tight constraints. And we just enforce them as equalities. So you see that here we just enforce the solution to be here, which is a very easy step and we can solve it very efficiently. Now, let's go back to the inventory problem that I described you before. We have the inventory level, the orders, and the demand. And we have these parameters, the initial value of the inventory and the demand, T. Now, the, the inequalities in, that appear in this problem are these ones that tells us that we cannot order less than zero and more than capital M at each time, T. So this is something that we can intuitively understand. And for this problem instance, with these parameters, if we, we can construct uh, decision tree that tells us which strategies 
we need to apply. So these three, it's, I'll show you later how to obtain it, but if you have, let's assume that we have full information about how the parameters change in this case, we know that we can recover a certain strategy and follow the tree and then obtain which constraints are active in this case. So we can say, okay, the initial value in the inventory is less than 9, 197, but greater than 7.91, we need to apply strategy 2. And strategy 2 is a number that encodes the constraints that are active or not. And in this case, it tells us, okay, before time 4, we don't need to order anything, and after time 4, we order between 0 and capital M. And if you want to, if we go back to the plot that we had before, this strategy, by the way, the other strategy will be slight variations of this where the time when we start ordering change changes depending on the parameters. And you can see also that if we know the problem, we know that we don't need to use all the demands that appear over the horizon. In this case, only D5 matters for the parameter choice that we have. And we see that for this problem, we actually, this is actually the strategy that is applied. So up to time four, we don't order, and then we start ordering to compensate the demand. And also you can see that after a while, this is the, these two curves match completely. So this means that what we want to order is exactly understood from the problem, because we need to match the demand and keep the value of the inventory to zero. This is an easy problem, but it's just to show you that we can understand it very easily by looking at which constraints are active. Okay, so is there any questions? Okay, let me move on then to a slightly more complicated problems where we include integer variables. So now we have the same problem as before, but we would like to solve problems where we have integers inside. So some components of x are restricted to be integral. And this is something that this problem translates to a mixed integer linear optimization problem and is extremely common in practice and we need to be able to solve these problems as well. But there's a, this makes things slightly more complicated when we want to define what the strategy means. So now the tight constraints are not enough to define the optimal solution. So if you see here, the tight constraint for this problem is, is just this red line. And then we know that the optimal solution we have that x1 is continuous, x2 is discrete, and the optimal solution falls here. But we, uh, if we just know which constraints are active, in order to find the optimal solution, we need to check between the different values of x2 which, ones, which one is the optimal. So we still need to solve an integer optimization problem, which is not really what we mean by having a strategy that allows us to compute the solution very efficiently. So instead, instead of using only the tight constraints, for integer problem, we add also the value of the integer variables. So it's not enough to have only the tight constraints, but we add also this other information in the strategy. And this is something that is, just tells us, okay, if you have some components of x that are integral, and we, we computed the optimal solution offline, we can store them and use them to identify the strategy. So in this case, if we know that x2 has this value, we can identify the optimal solution by just taking into account a combination of the tight constraint and the value of the integer variables. So, and then again, to solve the problem and to recover the optimal solution, we can just do it very easily as before. We just need to add this information about the, const the tight constraints by and also the value of the integer variables that we fix. So this is something that we can do very efficiently, still a linear program with equality constraints. Now, let's go back to an example. Now, it's a different one. It's an abstract problem. Most of you are familiar with this. It's a purely <coughs> integer optimization problem where we're trying to pick which items go into the knapsack, which is encoded by this variable x. And we know that we want to maximize the value of these elements and we have the constraints that the capacity of the knapsack needs to be satisfied, and also we cannot pick more elements. For each component of x, we cannot pick more than u elements. So this is still a parametric problem, and let's say that the parameters are a and u. And by using this concept of strategies, we can construct a similar tree as before, and the tree is something that can be described in this way. So by looking at how the components of the 
the parameters change, we can follow which strategy we apply. And similarly as before, we just see, okay, if the, if the value of u is greater than two and the value of a satisfies this uh, inequalities, we apply strategy one. That tells us that we don't pick any other item apart from item two twice, which is something that can be easily understood because it's just the value of the integer component. And this is, I will show you later how to construct these trees using machine learning, but the main idea here is that once we know how to investigate this tree, is something, extracting the optimal solution is something extremely easy. And also these problems can be extended to mixed integer convex optimization or something much more complicated. And in the paper we also treat these examples, but uh, I will not go into the details of this in this talk. I'll just, show you, I'll just tell you that this can be applied to general mixed integer convex problems where f and g are convex and x is the integral. So, okay, we have a way to find this uh, from the strategies to go to the optimal solution, but we don't know how to learn this using, from data. We don't know how to construct this, uh, these trees or these predictors that tells us which strategy to apply. And this can be done using um, the experience, I'll show you the experience that we have before. So this is still the outline that I had. So now I'll show you how machine learning plays a role here and how we use the parameters from experience to get the solutions and to get the strategy and then the solution. So the framework that we have is a classification problem. So we have data that are our parameters and the strategies related to our parameters. And this is something that we already have. We have n data points. And for each data point, we know that we have strategy S of theta i. Now, strategies are encoded by these numbers that I showed you before, which are uh, as Num m different ones, and these are the labels of our learning problem. And this is something that once we have data and labels, we can just solve in many different ways with many different predictors. And in this case, we want to use a multi-class classifier to predict from theta an estimate of the opti optimal strategy to apply. And I will show you two main methods that are used to do that. They, have, <coughs> they both have different benefits. The first one is classific optimal classification trees, which has been done in our group recently, which is a, classi a generalization of, the, of CARDs, so classification and regression trees, which uses modern machine learning, mo sorry, modern optimization methods to achieve much higher performance in terms of prediction. And it's also very interpretable because, as I showed you before, these are the same trees that I showed you before. It's easy to follow them and see when to apply each strategy. So how each parameter affect the problem and how we go to the different strategy numbers. Now, an extension of these are the trees with hyperplanes, which instead of having only parallel splits where we take into account only one component of the variables, we can take multiple ones. And these have the benefit that can achieve higher accuracy, higher prediction performance, and they need lower depth in order to achieve the same prediction performance. But on the other hand, it's a little bit harder to interpret these splits compared to the parallel ones. And this will be an interpretable method that I will apply. And on the other hand, I will also apply the standard neural networks, so some feed-forward ones, where I, we will train them also as a multi-class classification problem, and each layer is defined in this vector form, vector notation by an affine transformation, and uh, this element as a, that we crop, we take into account only the positive components of, the vec of this vector, which is the, in the literature, the value activation function. And I will implement them using PyTorch. So these are the two methods that I will apply to solve this learning problem and learn the strategies that we want to apply for to compute the optimal solution. But we, we're still not done yet because we don't know how well we know the problem and we don't know if our data is enough to understand what we mean by strategies and how many strategies appear. And this is something that is not clear from the beginning and it's hard to model as a, a priori using some bounds. So if you have data as before and we have the different strategy labels, how do we know that we've seen enough of them? How do we know that our data 
tells us a meaningful number of strategies that represent the ones that appear in our problem. And this is something that is hard to estimate before, and also is something that uh, makes a difference between doing a mapping between all the possible parameters, which is something very common in parametric optimization, and getting the strategies compared to just taking the ones that really matter. Because for different problems, we have different distributions of the parameters, and only some of them matter. And the strategies that appear might be only very few of them, and we cannot know this a priori. We need to know it by starting the, by seeing how data produces different strategies. So this problem is actually very common in natural language processing, and it's a problem that dates back to uh, the Second World War, and it's something that I'll describe you in a second. So the problem of finding new strategies can be described in this way. We have parameters, and we have n different ones that are the data that we collect. And then for each one, we get a different strategy. Now, some of them might appear multiple times, and some of them might appear only once. But the main idea is that we have many parameters, and the different number of strategies is very small. So we get only a few of them. And, but we don't know if we sample again if we will get something that we have already seen. This is something that is not clear because it depends on so many things related to the problem, the distribution of the parameters, how many we have seen so far, etc. So to solve this, we apply a method that has been around for a while that is related to some work by Alan Turing in decrypting the Enigma machine. So this is a very famous story that also appeared in a recent movie. And this is actually a picture of what this uh, device looked like. So the Enigma machine was uh, an encryption device used by the Nazi Navy to send out messages to, uh, regarding the location of where their ships and submarines would have been and attacked. And this is something that was ended up in the hands of the British government, but they weren't able to understand what it was doing. I mean, they were just unable to decrypt the messages. And the encryption code was made by, a, a part of the encryption code was a word that was appearing in a book of random words that appeared many times. So at the time they didn't know how to, the, the, it was impossible to check all the possible words appearing in the book because by hand it was practically invisible. And what they did is that they built a computer to do so, but still the computer was not able at that time to have all the capacity to solve this problem. So it, it was basically impossible to check all the possible words that appeared. But instead, they decided to use only a few of them and test the encryption key by using only those. And by checking only a few of them, they wanted to have some guarantees that they were taking the most representative ones. And if we think about words here in the same way as we think about strategies, we have some of them that appear many times and some of them that never appear. So there might be ways to understand what's, if we sample more, if it's needed to sample more or not. And this is exactly what they did when they developed the Good Turing estimator. So Good was a collaborator of Alan Turing, which finalized the work and then published the, the actual paper later on. And the main idea is very simple. So we have different strategies that appear. So these are the M labels that are, are in our classification problem. And these labels are, uh, they appear many times. So some of them 12, 45 times, twice. We don't know a priori. We just know it by sampling. And what we can do is that we can estimate the probability of finding unseen ones by this simple ratio. And the ratio is the ratio, on, the numerator is the number of strategies appeared once. And the denominator is the total number of samples. And this is actually very intuitive. If, if we think about drawing some cards from a deck, if we get always different cards, let's say we always get different cards, it means that the number of different cards, so the different strategies that appear only once, is very large. Which means that the likelihood, if you always sample a different card, the likelihood of sampling still another card that you haven't seen is very high. Well, if we keep on sampling and you always have very few cards and you have multiple copies of them, the likelihood of finding something that you've already seen 
is very high. So this means that you have already seen most or probably all the possible cards that you could draw. And this is the same as what we can apply to the strategies. So this is something that allows us to devise a very simple sampling scheme that works as follows without strong assumptions on the problem. So we just repeat this, this loop until the estimator is less than epsilon, which is the, the probability guarantee that we want. And the, the steps are very easy. We just sample a new pr parameter. We just compute the strategy for that by solving the problem. This is all done offline, so we can take as much time as we want. And then we update the estimator by checking the number of different strategies that appear once divided by the total number of samples. And when we're satisfied, we just stop. And we know that the strategies that we have seen represent the ones that can appear in the problem. And this is something that it can be implemented very easily. So, OK, so now we have the sampling scheme. We know how to uh, predict. We know that how to sample. We know which methods we can use to learn how to predict the strategies. And we know how the strategies allow us to compute the optimal solution very efficiently. But now, can we do something more about the speed ups? Can we actually solve these problems faster than before? This is the second goal that I told you at the beginning. And this is something that we can apply to a very general class of problems that are mixed integer quadratic program. So these are not simple linear programs, but we have the cos that is convex quadratic, so matrix P is positive semi-definite, we have polyhedral constraints and integer variables. And if you apply the strategy, which is the combination of tight constraints and the value of the integer variables are the solution, computing the optimal solution boils down to solving an equality constraint quadratic program, which is something that can be done very efficiently nowadays and does not involve any integer variables. And if you go back to um, our optimality conditions for quadratic programs, we know that we can solve this problem by solving just a KKT system, which is a sparse symmetric linear system that we are able to solve for extremely large dimensions. And I don't know if you're getting how the importance of this, but this means that the unhappy hard problem that we have to solve many times using experience and data is brought to a simple linear system solution that we can do at extremely high speeds. And for online applications, this is very important because it doesn't depend on what we used to compute the strategies before. It doesn't depend on the predictor. It's something that we're able to solve on an extremely, extremely easily with very little code. So we implemented all of this in a Python package that does the following. So offline, we do the learning, and we can take as much time as we want. So we use CVXPy to model the, the problems, and then we perform this sampling using this estimator that I described you before. Then after we have enough data, we just perform the training of the neural networks or cl optimal classification trees, whatever you prefer. Of course, you know that if you use the neural networks, it will be harder to interpret the predictor <coughs> because it's a combination of functions, while the trees will be something like what I showed you before, which is easier to understand. So depending on how much interpretability you want in the model, then you choose your own predictor. And by the way, this can be extended to any multi-class classifier that you want. And online, what we do is that we, we perform what we described as the actual optimization. We predict the strategies using machine learning, what we learned, and this is done very fast. And we decode the solution, which is also something that up to mixed integer quadratic programs, which is an extremely general class of problems, which probably in practice counts by to 99% of what people solve. We solve this by solving a simple linear system. And I'll show you a couple of benchmarks to let you understand how this works. So the first one is a facility location problem. This is very uh, popular in OR. I mean, the, the goal is to, we have some locations and the goal is to decide where to build some fa facilities to minimize the distribution to some warehouses, distribution of goods to the other warehouses. So we need to decide where to build them. And these are simple mixed integer linear programming problem where we have the, these binary decisions that tell you for each i in the, in the set 
F, whether to build the facility or not. And there's a cost of building the facility. And then also we have the shipment cost that tell you from location I to warehouse J, how much we want to ship. And this is a non-negative continuous variable. And then we have two constraints, which are the, to satisfy the demand of the warehouses and to satisfy the supply from each facility. So it's a standard problem and it's a mixed integer linear program. And we know that the in this case, we assume that the parameters are the demand that we have at each warehouse. And if we put everything into our framework, we can solve this problem, we obtain this two plots. So the first one is the accuracy, where we compare the accuracy of the optimal classification trees, the trees with hyperplanes, and the neural networks. And we see that in general it's pretty high, and we see a degradation here when the number of different facilities and warehouses increases, and this is due by the fact, to the fact that the depth of the trees and the depth of the neural networks needs to be increased in order to capture the different strategies. But in general, for the other problems, we're still very high, but the, most, the more impressive thing is also that the time that we need to solve these problems online compared to Groby is 100 times faster. So instead of taking one second, we can solve it in a few milliseconds or 10, tens of milliseconds. And this is something that maybe for facility location is not so critical, but for other problems is extremely critical, the speed. And I'll show you also another example that is hybrid vehicle control. So we are, it's a problem where we actually need to solve it very, very fast. And we have um, a car with a battery, an electric motor, and we have some power that is fed into the chassis of the car. And then we have a tank, a combustion engine, and we have some power that comes from the engine. So we need to regulate when to turn on the combustion engine in order to minimize some losses. And we regulate the level of the battery in the car by playing around with these variables. And the problem can be easily formulated in this way, where we have a desired power that we know over a certain horizon, and we want the power provided by the battery and the combustion engine to satisfy this desired power. And also we have some battery dynamics that tell you how the level of energy stored in the battery evolves over time. And this is affected by how much energy we suck from the battery in order to feed the desired power. This is an integer pro mixed integer program because we have also the decision that means when to switch on the combustion engine at each time step. And this affects the cost because we have a part of the cost that, has, that is related to how much the engine consumes, related to the power that we ask from the combustion engine. And the part of the cost that tells us whether we turn on the engine, we pay a delta price. And we want to minimize this trade-off. Now the parameters in this case are the desired power over the horizon and the initial value of the energy in the battery. And again, we feed this into our system. This is the mixed integer quadratic program now. And we get this, this plot. So we have the, the accuracy, which is, which is still the same behavior as before. And, but the time in this case starts to be extremely different than the online solution that we get from Groby. So apart from the cases where the horizon is short and we don't have many integer variables, when you start to have four, horizon 40, we can have 10, uh, three orders of magnitude, so a thousand times speed ups compared to solving the problem from scratch using Groby. So this means that using, since we're solving the problem many times, we're using the experience to learn how to solve it more efficiently. So, okay, with that, I would like to give you some concluding remarks, unless, okay, so um, the main point of this talk that I wanted to get across is that optimization in the real world is parametric. There's, we solve many problems multiple times, and we solve them with slightly varying parameters and data. There's nothing that really changes apart from this data and the problems, and we're not doing at the moment much about it. We're just solving them from scratch, or maybe we're starting some solutions, but we're not using the data to learn the strategy to solve these problems. And in this work, we try to apply these two, we did these two things. First, we try to understand the problem and interpret how the parameters affect the solution using machine learning. And on the other hand, we devise a method that is able to solve these problems using these predictions extremely faster 
than commercial software. So if you're more interested, there's this paper on archive, and I'll be happy to answer any question. Uh, Bart, uh, just a question on the, the probability of uh, not finding a new strategy when you're sampling. Mm -hmm. uh, does it make an assumption that you're sampling for the true distribution <coughs> of the parameters? Sorry? Does it make the assumption that you're sampling for the, from the true distribution of the parameter? Because yeah, it seems to me like when you have, for example, your tree, if you don't know a priori the scaling of the parameter, you might be always sampling from the same leaf. And then after the sample two, you will stop. Uh, no, actually, you assume to sample from the true distribution. I mean, in the case, if you look at the real world problem, you just take data from experience, so the problems that you solved before, and then you just feed them to the, you don't make any other assumptions. I mean, otherwise, you're not sampling, well, for the trees, the thing is that you're, okay, maybe, um, from the, this is independent from the what method you're using for learning afterwards, the sampling part. Uh, sure, this. but if you imagine the, the, the tree is the truth, mm -hmm. and like some leaves are, have a wide area. So if you're sampling mm -hmm. uniformly two parameters, the probability that the second sample would be in the same leaf as the first one can be pretty high. <coughs> so mm -hmm. does you make the assumption that, for example, n is large, and so then you should, instead of GT being one over n, you should correct it for small samples. Or yeah, you make for, samples that I mean, it, so in the, um, I mean, this, I simplified it a bit in the talk in the sense that you want to see actually what happens is that, of course, this will converge for large samples, but there's some bounds for smaller number of samples where we compensate for the fact that we're converging there. So, yes, yeah. yes, this is actually what we use. I mean, to simplify the exposition, I didn't want to put everything there, but yet, yeah, for small number of samples, you need to take into account that. And of course, this quantity goes down with the number of samples. So for large samples, you. But in general, what happens, what I've seen is that if we start from, let's say, a few thousand samples, and then we start doing this reasoning. So we sample a first batch of a few thousand, then we go on, then we're already very close to what the estimator does. Because the one problem could be that as you say, you might have that the, the classes that appear only once are very little. Maybe there's no class that appears only once if you have very few samples. But if you start with more from the beginning, it's, you're already very close. So what we do in practice is that we first sample the first batch, and then we go on by increasing it. So on the same line, uh, so you do have guarantees on the fact that uh, the, the offline part of the algorithm is going to converge. The Guarantees in which sense that if you sample more, you... Yes, that for any given problem, you will have a minimum number of samples after which you have the, basically the set of strategies that allow you to solve any, any problem. Yeah we, yeah, we assume that if we sample enough, they, we get all the strategies that, can, that basically so can appear. The theorem suggests that uh, as n goes to infinity, the first theorem falls. The second one, if you... Finite, if you sort, if you, within epsilon, you have guarantees of what n will mean. Now, the complication is that this machine learning, while extremely accurate, they are not 100%. Okay? So they, you lose accuracy. Yeah. In field, practically speaking, one thing. Yeah, that's true that the fact that if you've seen all the strategies, it doesn't mean that you're predicting them perfectly. Yeah, that's, so this means that also depending on the predictor that you choose, you might have more or less. Also, there's also the fact that after we, I mean, in practice, after we have sampled enough to guarantee this bound, we also sample a more in order to guarantee that the predictor gives us, uh, is fed with enough number of samples. So this is enough to see all the possible strategies, but of course, you might want to sample more in order to give it to the predictor. But in general, yeah, this is supposed to converge to the converges to the strategies that we, if we sample enough, it tells you that the meaningful strategies are the ones that you see. And also the, of course this, you cannot understand, 
you cannot know, the, the key behind this is that you cannot know a priori how many samples you need. Because the problems can be so different and a parameter that changes a little bit can affect your solution in a drastic way while a, you cannot bound it unless you want to give some very pessimistic bounds that are not realistic. It's very hard to understand it without doing these iterations. I've seen from these problems. Yes? So how large were your ends and the number of strategies in these examples before? So, and also, yeah, okay, sorry. Sorry, yeah, you were. Oh, I'll ask the next question. Okay. So the, for the ones that I've seen, I mean, the, the examples that I had were synthetic. So we're going to work also on some realistic problems now. But uh, the, um, the ones that we've seen, were, we were getting strategies that were a few tens, or maybe maximums around 100 of different. This doesn't mean different solution. This means different active constraints. Of course, you can get many more solutions with the same strategy. And the samples, we will get a few thousands or 10,000. And this was done all offline, the learning, while the prediction part, of course, was independent. The speed of the prediction part is completely independent by the samples that you but it's use. Nice to give that, right? Because if it's MP hard, it's obviously the MP hard is going in here. And how many samples, essentially? I, um, I would say that it's going into the, the learning problem is also MP hard. I mean, learning the trees and learning the neural networks is a hard problem. But the, the incredible thing is that for many problems, I mean, if you look at the literature on parametric optimization, they just, especially in control, they try to map all the parameter space and find all the possible combinations of active constraints, which is something that works for, for problems that are very, very small. And then the combinations explode. But in practice, you will never find them. You will find there's many applications where actually the strategies that appear from the samples are, it's a very small number, and you can grasp it using this. So uh, some problems that are NP hard, actually, they, uh, they turn out to a very small number of strategies. OK, to compute the strategy might be hard, because you, but you're doing it offline, and you can take as much time as you want, at least for these problems that. The end, <coughs> Caroline also asked perhaps about dimension. I remember mm -hmm. you tried it a few hundred, like the city location, a few uh, hundred. I don't remember this one, but. Uh, the, yeah, it depends. Is, is a function of dimension. So if, let's say, n equals. This is 80. I mean, the number of continuous variables is 80 by 80 times 80. And then the number of integer variables is 80 in this, for this larger problem. For control, I mean, this means a few thousand variables with which. But thousands of variables. Yeah. Not perhaps a million variables. Yeah, we haven't done it for larger ones. Okay. But, That's what you would expect in the statistical problem, right? Because the networks, probably all their strategies 
you're removing an edge, you're going to remove other edges as well. Sure. And that would come out there. That's why you don't have to. Yeah. 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 Uh, once you learn these strategies and you get a new data point theta, right? I mean, what mm -hmm. is the guarantee that the, strat the predicted strategy that you recommend, right, is going to be feasible for the problem, for the new data? Well, of course, formally we haven't proven that, but empirically we've tested that. The, so actually, what we do in practice is that instead of testing one, we can just since it's so quick to solve these problems, you can just solve it for the most likely three, four, or five strategies. And then we pick the ones that are feasible, and between the feasible ones, we pick the best one. And this turned out, at least in these cases, to always, between the best strategies, to find a feasible, very good one, where the, the, the worst case infeasibility is very low, and also the suboptimality in general is very low. We have some results in the paper. But it's, a, it's not correct to assume that the commercial codes give you feasible solutions. So they have an, an absolute, they have two parameters that they are, they are set to default of 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus, I don't remember the exact number. But there is a feasibility, uh, the, the, the reason you have a potentially feasible solution is because there's rounding, and these are numerical and algebra there. So there is a parameter, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7. So it's not correct that what you think is feasible is in fact mathematically feasible. But you could end up with inconsistent Yeah. I'm not guarantees, but I would like to argue this is not valid. This guarantee that we're looking is not present in what we are carrying. There's no guarantee. Yeah, I mean, unless it's a convex continuous problem and you can check. Not too long ago, I remember I could not solve the damn problem. It was giving me feasible solutions, would not be. And I couldn't figure out what was. So, nah, I was looking at the problem. I was looking, no, it was because of that. There are no guarantees. It, it, we, we are not guaranteed, but we have company. <laughs> Quick, quick question on uh, this empirical data on uh, the bottom half. Is that tested against uh, Garobi starting from scratch, or is it a restarted optimization where it's nearby in parameter space? No, in this case, it started from scratch. Also, yeah, no, in this case, I'm not warm starting Garobi. I'm, I assume it might go faster, but I find it really hard to believe that we can solve an integer program at the same speed as solving a Linux system. For the Linux system, we're using Matt kernel library, so it solves a sparse, L, it performs a sparse LDL factorization and then forward backward substitution. But yeah, it's, it could probably go faster for some problems. Thank you. But yeah, the, I wouldn't say that for, so if you're solving some, for example, a control problem where the trajectory is close, the one, the state at one time step is close to the state at the previous time step, then you can get benefits. But here, the thetas that we pass might be very far from each other. So I'm not totally sure you will get benefits from that. Just to illustrate, the oil delivery problem I'm talking about needs about two hours to solve daily. Two hours. Uh, even if you do resolving heuristics and so forth. Be able to solve it in under a second. You can do it a little bit better than two hours, but it's not going to be milliseconds. Are there any further questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Bart, again for a great final presentation, and thank you everyone for attending the 2019 ORC IEP seminar. Thank you. Thank you.